Okay, perfect. So anyway, as uh, reported, I'm Keith, and I'm one of the original eight kids that started Food Not Bombs. And I was 22 at that time, and uh, I was uh, studying painting and sculpture. And uh, to get a degree, I also had to take academic classes, and one of them was American history with uh, Professor Howard Zinn. And so uh, he, would he wrote a book called The People's History of the United States. Um, passed away about two years ago, I guess now. And he would uh, talk about these protests he was going to up in Seabrook, New Hampshire to stop the nuclear power station. And so me and my classmates organized what we called an affinity group, and we went up on to a bunch of the protests, including the May 24th, uh, um, 1980 occupation attempt of the construction site. And Brian was a, uh, well, a law student at BU, got arrested at this event, and so we had to raise money for his legal defense. And the first thing that came in mind was to do bake sales. So we'd be at the student union selling our brownies and our cookies and everything, and of course we'd make like $3, $4, and we're like, wow, this will never become a defense fund at this rate. And uh, along with doing that, like most college students, we had to make a living in all kinds of ways. And we had a van, an old uh, Dodge van, and we had a moving company with this van called Smooth Move. And we were moving this family one day, and they were throwing out a poster that said, wouldn't it be a beautiful day if the schools had all the money they needed and the Air Force had to hold the bake sale to buy a bomber? And we thought, this is fantastic. So we go to the Army-Navy surplus store at Central Square. We buy some military uniforms. <clears throat> we make little general badges. And we uh, go out with our poster and our uh, baked goods. And we tell people we're trying to buy a bomber, help us out. <laughs> and people would go by and go, wow, you don't really look like soldiers. And we go, wow, you know, we're down our luck. We're trying to raise money. <laughs> and uh, in those days, Ronald Reagan was famous for like a $3,500 bolt for a, a bomber where you could go to the hardware store and get the same bolt for 30 cents. So we had our bolt on the table, we say we're making headway, we've got the bolt, help us out. <laughs> and people were like, wow, that's like, it seems a little crazy. And then eventually we admit to the fact that our friend had been in jail and we were trying to raise money for his legal defense and we talked to him about why we were against Seabrook Nuclear Power Station and the nuclear arms race and stuff. And then uh, I was also a produce worker in the mornings at a grocery store called Bread and Circus, which is sort of similar to uh, Whole Foods that we have now. Before that time, they were either, you know, kind of commercial grocery stores or the food co-ops. And so I was working at, at Bread and Circus in the morning, and, and people, I'd keep coming in every morning seeing that a lot of the produce hadn't sold, and it was kind of disheartening. So I started taking the wilted... Uh, produce and the stuff that was a little bruised or didn't look perfect uh, um, at, to the housing projects a couple of blocks from the grocery store on Portland Ave. And one day I'm hanging out with the people collect, that I'm giving the food to and they were talking and said, isn't that weird, your buildings are falling down but they just put this huge glass building across the street from you. And they go, yeah, that's where they're designing nuclear bombs. And so I looked into it and it turned out it was Draper Lab and they were designing the guidance system for intercontinental nuclear missiles. So that gave us the idea to have the name Food Not Bombs, since there were people on one side of Portland Ave that needed food, and people on the other side that didn't need the food because they were making so much money building bombs. So, and so we decided there'd be three principles. That the food would always be free and, ve and vegan or vegetarian, and free to anyone without restriction, rich or poor, drunk or sober. That the second one would be that we would not have any presidents or directors or headquarters or anything like that, that each chapter would be autonomous and use the consensus process to make decisions and try to actively invite the people eating with us to participate in, in our, our meetings and in uh, formulating the direction of each local Food Not Bombs group. And then the third one was that we would be dedicated to nonviolence and that we wouldn't be a charity but that we would work for nonviolent social change to change society so no one would have to uh, stand in line to eat at a soup kitchen or live in the streets. And then after that we made a huge amount of food and we went down to Aquatic Park where Columbus was scheduled to land. And this time the Native American community just waded out into uh, uh, the bay and pushed Columbus back out to sea, saying 500 years is enough. 
And then uh, some of the Food Not Bombs kids went to the Columbus Avenue Parade and they stole the Nina, the Pinta, and the Santa Maria off the floats and were chased through North Beach by the Italian American Association. And then we had a big party and we got books to everybody and they went home to start more Food Not Bombs groups in uh, their neighborhoods. So then after that, the uh, chief of police decided he'd run for mayor on the anti-homeless ticket. And then if he was elected, he would round up all the homeless people, put them in a work camp south of the city with a sign over the entrance saying, work shall make you free. So uh, he gets elected and he starts his program, Quality of Life Enforcement Matrix Program. And he gets two airplanes from the Justice Department with thermal imaging devices so they can fly up and down the streets and parks and see the body heat of where the homeless are living and round them up. And so we go to American Civil Liberties Union and we get a, a video camera from them uh, camcorder so we can videotape anything happening in our meals and sure enough right away the the matrix squad comes in they order everyone to take their shoes off and throw them in the garbage trucks they take their sleeping bags and blankets the uh, animal control comes and takes everyone's pets away they arrest a few people on warrants they say some people are too uh, mentally ill to be outside and take them off to the psych ward at San Francisco General and a grandmother is uh, we videotape a grandmother fighting to save her photo album of her grandchildren as the police rip it out of her arms and throw it in the garbage truck. So we give that video to uh, the uh, TV companies and Channel 2 in Oakland airs it and the mayor is furious. It makes his uh, homeless program look uh, inhumane. So he goes to the city attorney Louise Rennie and gets a court order against us serving food without a permit and he, uh, and he goes to the parks department and has them delete the permit process. So now we start getting arrested for felony conspiracy to serve food in violation of court order. So the nuns come out with the priests and the rabbis and everybody, they get arrested and they have to spend the night in jail. The, uh, the teachers have to spend the night in jail. We get, have to spend the night in jail. And so this goes on and on. And the punk band Kafka from uh, Genoa, Italy had translated my book into Italian and they asked me to do a book tour. So we go back over to Europe and the first city we go to is Zagreb, Croatia. And the people in uh, Zagreb, Funa Bombs, are like, why are you just visiting us in, in Zagreb? We have groups in six cities in Croatia. I'm like, wow, I didn't even know there were six cities in Croatia, let alone six Funa Bombs groups. That's insane. <laughs> and so everybody agreed to come to the Zagreb and help cook food and everything. And I gave a presentation to everybody. And the next day was uh, uh, anti-McDonald's Day, October 16th. So we went down to the McDonald's to hand out vegan burgers. And uh, they had ordered these black balloons with golden arches that said, eat shit in Croatian to give all the kids as they came into the McDonald's. <laughs> and then another uh, animal rights group had bought a severed uh, head of a cow at a, a slaughterhouse and brought it to the restaurant on a silver platter. And then the uh, Food Not Bombs kids in Zagreb said, man, you should go to uh, uh, Serbia where they were doing Food Not Bombs while being bombed. So we went to Belgrade and we met them at this place called Rebel Squat, which was this huge mansion in downtown Belgrade. And they're telling us what it was like to be cooking and serving food while cruise missiles would go down the street and veer off and blow up houses and uh, just some incredible stories, whole mountains disappearing. And Emma, who was a, uh, a nursing student, was working in this special hospital with 750 severely mutated children that were mutated from the depleted uranium. And that was only just a couple of years after the end of the war. And so we served food downtown at the McDonald's there, and, and then we uh, got to Istanbul, and uh, turned out George Bush was going to come there, and there's going to be a, uh, a NATO meeting, and so we organized the Food Not NATO action outside the first McDonald's in the Muslim world. And uh, we, the first guy in line turned to everybody and said, this is great food, we love it. This is in Tascan Square where those big protests just happened with Ghazi Park. And so he was all excited and saying, this is a wonderful food. And it turned out he was the uh, manager of the McDonald's. So all the employees come marching out with trays of ice cream and Coke to give out to free for everybody. And then we went over to Tel Aviv. And uh, we've, when we finally find the Funa Bonds kids there, they tell us that um, they had refused to fight in the Israeli Defense Forces when they got out of high school and they went to prison. When they got out, they decided to have a Refusenik concert conference and they figured that they needed to have food at their conference so they started a food up bombs to feed their conference and these Palestinian farmers came and told them how they were blocked out from their fields and they couldn't uh, harvest their food but they were going to have a peace camp for two uh, months on the West Bank so the come on in so the food not bombs uh, activist um, 
uh, during this two months of feeding this peace camp, decided that they would organize a thing called Anarchist Against the Wall. And so the day we were arriving on December 26, it turned out that they were doing the first Anarchist Against the Wall action. And they had arrived to the uh, wall near where the peace camp had been, started cutting through the, uh, one of the gates when Israeli Defense Forces arrived, with, uh, started shooting live ammunition at them. And one of the Funa bombs activists, Gil, got injured. And so they were busy trying to get him back into Israel to a hospital, and that's why they never came to the airport. And then the next day, we made this huge amount of food, went to a protest organized by Greenpeace outside the Knesset, where they were trying to get the Israeli government to pass a law that all foods would have to be labeled uh, if they're genetically modified or not. And at 5 o'clock, the uh, activists come out and they go, hey, they passed the law. All the GMO uh, foods have to be labeled in Israel. And uh, we planted all the trees on the path of the West Bank and uh, on the West Bank where, near Jerusalem where the uh, wall was supposed to be uh, put up. And we fed, there's a lot of Russian immigrants that live on the streets of Tel Aviv and Jerusalem. And so we fed them. And it was this amazing experience. And then when I came back, I got a call from a woman named uh, Cindy Sheehan. She wanted us to feed, uh, um, she was camping outside of uh, Crawford, Texas, outside of George Bush's summer home, and wanted to ask him why her son Casey had been killed. So we called Dallas Food Not Bombs to bring food, but they couldn't, they were being arrested every week. So I went there with my friends and we fed people at Camp Casey all the rest of the summer. And it's there in that time we find out there's a hurricane coming towards the Gulf. So uh, we decided we'll help with the rescue effort in New Orleans. And so I put up a little web page, foodnotbombs.net, uh, Katrina. And the first volunteers came to uh, down to Baton Rouge from uh, Hartford Food Not Bombs. And Dan calls me and said, wow, we got to a military checkpoint and they won't let us in. We need a letter of permission. And I said, don't worry, Dan, I'll make you a letter of permission. So I made some letterhead, wrote a letter of permission, signed it, emailed it to him. He put it in the window of the bus and goes to the checkpoint the next morning. They go, oh, that's great. You got your letter of permission. So uh, now the Red Cross is calling, like, I'm getting all these calls. Hi, the Red Cross gave us this number for food. Where's the food? And before long, we had kitchens in 20 cities in Louisiana, Mississippi, and Alabama. It turned out the Red Cross had an agreement. They wouldn't bring food down there. And we fed people for the next eight months in uh, all these cities, including also uh, on the Astrodome in, the, in uh, Houston and the convention center there. And then I get an email from Funap Bombs in St. Petersburg, Russia. They had been providing meals at anti-racist <coughs> protests for many years. And so while they're sharing food at their regular meal on Sunday at the downtown bookstore, a group of neo-Nazis arrived with knives and started stabbing the Funap Bombs volunteers, killing the founder of St. Petersburg Funap Bombs, Tumur. So this became a pattern where Funa Bombs activists were being killed at, while either cooking at, at, at protests or serving food on the streets in cities all over Russia. And then one day, I get another email. It turns out that neo-Nazis had set off a time bomb at the St. Petersburg meal, but we were late by about 10 minutes, so no one got hurt. And I have uh, photos of that in the Funa Bombs book. And then I also got emails from Christchurch, New Zealand. They said they were going to protest the um, free market uh, economic policies that their government was proposing by having a really, really free market and giving away free food and free everything in the city park once a month. And that idea started spreading all over Asia. There was uh, on Buy Nothing Day in Jakarta, they had a huge, uh, really, really free market with free haircuts, free acupuncture, free massages, as well as free appliances and food and clothing and so on. And then Heather Flores emailed saying that uh, she had seen um, all these trucks of grass going uh, lawns being grown in the Willamette Valley and she was working in Eugene Food Not Bombs and she just thought it was horrible she'd be gardening and watching the sod be sent south. So she started a project called Food Not Lawns Community Gardens and before long Food Not Bombs activists all over the world were taking over abandoned lots and bringing the people eating with them to help them cultivate organic uh, uh, vegetables and fruit trees in these empty lots and we had like a huge one for instance in Hempstead at the Long Island Railroad train station we have them there there's like hundreds of Food Not Lawns Community gardens now and people just growing vegetables in their front yards if nothing else and uh, also Homes Not Jail started getting big again and um, around that time the Florida city started making the large group feeding laws and one of our volunteers was arrested in Orlando
And so we took that to court. He won all the cases, and then we lost in the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals in Atlanta, Georgia. And uh, so we prepared to be arrested in June of 2011. At the same time, we were already starting to work with other groups like Heather, uh, like uh, Margaret Flowers and Kevin Zees and other uh, organizers to do an occupation of uh, Freedom Plaza near the White House on the 10th anniversary of the U.S. invasion of Afghanistan. And so we start getting arrested, and we have the, the city of Orlando makes 24 arrests. But Anonymous is blocking the Disney websites and Universal Studio websites with images of Funa Bombs activists being arrested, saying, free uh, Funa Bombs, stop the arrest. And so eventually the mayor freaks out, and he announces, OK, I'm going to stop arresting the Funa Bombs. And, uh, and they can serve any time they want in front of City Hall, and I'll even come with a, a pepper from my garden to help them out. And so that stops the arrest. But now, when I get out of jail after 19 days, I, my inbox is full of adbuster emails about Occupy Wall Street. So we mobilize even more, and we uh, set up a kitchen in Zuccotti Park, and I, uh, after doing that, I go down to uh, uh, DC, and I thought originally I was going to do Freedom Plaza, but I found a bunch of people in, uh, in, um, on K Street doing another uh, Occupy there, uh, McPherson Park, so I helped them with their kitchen, and before long there's kitchens all over the world. And I go to Boston, uh, Occupy Boston, with a big delivery of produce from farmers in Western Mass, and I set up the table after breakfast, and these people walk by and they go, oh wow, we do food not bombs in our town, I go, what town's that? And they go, Oh, Johannesburg, you know where that is? And I go, is that South Africa? And they go, yeah, that's South Africa. And I'm like, well, I haven't heard from you since you sent me a link to your uh, uh, MySpace. And then I pointed to the, uh, there was a fire hydrant across the street from where my table was. I said, see that fire hydrant, the yellow fire hydrant? And they go, yeah, what about it? I said, well, that's where the first Food Not Bombs meal ever happened on March 26, 1981, where we came out to protest the uh, policies of the Bank of Boston and that they made, uh, they continued to invest in the way they were. People in America might have to actually stand in line to eat at soup kitchens. And sure enough, 33 years later, people are standing in line to eat at soup kitchens. And so uh, I got an email shortly after that from uh, St. Petersburg, Russia, Food Not Bombs. There's a ship called the Aurora that fired the first shot in the Bolshevik Revolution that's now a historic museum. Well, on the anniversary of the Bolshevik Revolution, they snuck past the guards, climbed up on the mast of the ship, took down the Russian flag, and they put up an Occupy flag, which was a pie with a slice taken out of it. And, uh, and like a Jolly Rogers, instead of bones, they had a fork and a spoon for the for the, uh, um, the bones on a Jolly Rogers. And then I ended up going over to Iceland, and it turned out that they, uh, people made fun of them for feeding people, no one's poor in Iceland. And then uh, it turned out the prime minister, and who was also the president of the bank, National Bank, had invested in the housing market in the US. And so uh, their economy collapsed. And people would read the flyers at the Funat Bombs meals every Saturday. And eventually they'd say, man, we should march on the parliament building. And so sure enough, they would march every Saturday after the Funat Bombs meal to the parliament building. It turns out there's a 7-Eleven type store in Iceland where the logo is a pink pig, like a piggy bank, uh, bright pink, on a blue background. So they take that flag and they climb up on the, some Funat Bombs kids climb up on the parliament building. They take the Icelandic flag down. They put up the the discount store flag and everyone cheers and the police arrest them and they all march to the police station to free the activist and then the prime minister resigns and now they're crowdsourcing their constitution for Iceland today trying to come up with an actual real uh, democracy and they voted twice to reject paying out the banks first before paying out the people. So now Funa Bombs is in over a thousand cities of the world and I just was visiting them in uh, uh, the Philippines, where they're um, um, before the ta this most recent typhoon, where they are working on making like footbridges in neighborhoods so people can get through the floods and are providing food and all kinds of uh, other support to people. We have a chapter in Cebu, which is close to the uh, epicenter of the typhoon. And I went to uh, Indonesia, and we have chapters in over 100 cities there. And they had been involved. The Medan Food Not Bombs was at the epicenter of the Christmas tsunami, and they were, did the rescue effort there as well. So um, anyway, so now there's like Food Not Bombs uh, all over the world, and I have a short, like, 14-minute video of Food Not Bombs in Nigeria that I'd like to show, and then I'd love people to ask questions and come up and get information and find out how to get involved in organizing of Food Not Bombs here in Minneapolis and in St. Paul. So thanks, you guys.